Good morning, church. Good to see you again. And if you're serving on the nominating committee and you know that that's, uh, that's you, if, that, if your name is on the nominating committee, can I just meet with you after the service so that we can figure out what we're doing for that? I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, as we share a parable there. Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to be reading from verse 21 to 35. Now, while you're finding that, let me also just outline for you, starting with the beginning of chapter 18, what is happening in this chapter, because it is kind of, well, it helps to understand what Jesus is getting at with this parable, a well-known parable. So in Matthew chapter 18, it begins with an argument. It's a topic which the disciples have been arguing over for a while. It keeps coming up every so often throughout the story of the Gospels. And the question or the argument is, who is going to be the greatest? Who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And so what Jesus does is he calls a child to him. And he says to them, you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then you must become like this child. Now children, of course, particularly in that culture, although they were highly prized, particularly male children who would continue the name of the family, d despite being highly prized, they were not the highest in terms of the echelon of society. And so the children were sort of to behave, be good, stay out of sight type of thing. And uh, of course, when Jesus says to them, you need to become like little children, that's quite a revolution just in and of itself. The children are unassuming. The children are trusting. They are dependent upon their parents. They have faith in their parents. And so Jesus says, if you want to be the greatest, then you must be like these little children. Then Jesus goes on in his next section from verse 6 to 9 to warn about offending a little child, such as the one he's just held up as an example of those who will inherit the kingdom of God. And he says that it's inevitable in this world that an offense will come, a stumbling, a cause for stumbling that will cause such as these little children who are helpless and dependent and trusting and uh, innocent uh, to fall, to lose their innocence, perhaps even will cause them to question the concept of faith and trust. He says it's inevitable that opportunities for stumbling will come, but woe to the person by whom they come. And in a way, what he's saying to the disciples is, this spirit that you're entertaining will be the very source of stumbling for such as are children. This spirit of ambition, this spirit of selfishness, this spirit to rise above one's fellows, to lord it over, to have the authority, to be the big boss, is the very spirit of stumbling that a little child is the opposite of. And if you're to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you don't want to lose. In the next section, he tells the story, a parable, of a lost sheep. And you know that one quite well, verse 10 to 14. After saying you need to become like one of these little children, and beware that you do not become the source of stumbling in them by infusing them and imbuing them with a spirit of selfish ambition, with a spirit that is unbecoming for the kingdom of heaven, that you become one of those stumbling stones, he then paints a picture of the Father's heart and love for the lost. Are you following the train of thought, the logic? So his next step is to describe to these disciples the spirit of the Father, the intent, the motive, the love of the Father. And of course it's the story of the lost sheep which you know well. One, one sheep goes missing out of 99. The, sh the farmer doesn't just write it off and say, oh well, such is business, we'll just write off our losses. But he goes out searching for that one lost sheep. So desperate is he to bring that one lost sheep home. And then Jesus transitions from the love of the father for the lost sheep to the true spirit of discipleship. The true spirit of love that a disciple of the Father should have for a lost sheep. And he describes how we are to treat those who have sinned against us. Those who have offended us. Those who drive us up the wall. Right? And he says, in the light of the story about the parable of the sheep, right? In the light of that setting, the love of the Father 
in, in searching for the one lost sheep, he says in essence, all true kingdom members will seek for those who offend, those who are lost, those who are overcome by sin, will seek for them and their restoration in the same way that the father goes seeking for the lost sheep. Are you with me? Are you following the logic of his little sermon here? And so it's in the light of this that we come to this parable. So it starts in verse 21, and it says the following. Then Peter came to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now read that question in the light of the sermon. Jesus, Peter, of course, being the outspoken one in the group, is trying to present a very generous spirit here. You see, in the minds of the scribes and the Pharisees, it was very much like we have in our world today amongst the police system and the courts and so on. Three strikes and you're out. You get your first chance, you get your second chance, third chance, that's it, you're done, no more mercy, we take care of you. Lock you up, punish you, whatever it is. And so, so, so when Peter comes to Jesus and says, how many times shall I tolerate a sinning brother? Seven times. He is going way beyond the norm. Does that make sense? Peter is just being super magnanimous. He's just being absolutely generous with this idea that I would allow up to seven times that one brother would offend me before I write him off, tell him I will have nothing more to do with him and kick him out. And it's in the light of this that Jesus tells the following story. Because it is evident from Peter's question that he did not get entirely what Jesus was trying to say with the logic of his little speech or sermon up to that point. The father goes looking for that one lost sheep, one lost sheep. And so every disciple, every follower of the father, every one of the sheep that are in the fold should be a part of that spirit of the father in seeking the lost. Okay, well, how many times should I do this? How many times should I allow, allow a brother to fall in sin, to offend me before I came out? Seven times, right? I mean, that's just more than twice what the norm would be. I mean, that's got to be pretty generous. And so Jesus tells a parable to more fully explain what he's tried to already convey. And it goes like this, verse 22. So Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, if you do the mathematical calculation on that, that's 490 times. Still a literal number. But it's not the literal number that Jesus is going for. Jesus has taken Peter's seven times and magnified that symbolically by this massive number. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. And the reason we know it's not a literal number is because when you get down to verse 32, 33, 34, it is evident that Jesus is going for infinity. There is to be no end in the grace of the follower of Jesus as there is no end to the grace of the, in the heart of the Father. Does that make sense? But we'll get there. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, just lock that number down in your mind for a moment, okay? 10,000 talents. In English, that means nothing. What is 10,000 talents? We'll come back to that. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he, that he be sold with his wife, his children, and all that he had, and that payment be made. So he hands him over to the debt collectors. Now this was a common cultural practice. It was practiced amongst the Jews. It was practiced amongst the heathen. And the, in fact, the way that it was practiced within Judaism was mixed with mercy. Because Judaism, as was received as, the, as, as in the Old Testament, God had revealed himself through the prophet Moses and others to the Jews, this practice of selling yourselves as a servant or a slave to someone to pay back a debt that you owe to them was not disallowed. 
It wasn't that you couldn't have slaves or that you couldn't be sold as a slave or that you yourself couldn't voluntarily sell yourself into slavery to pay back a debt. But where it was different to the heathen nations around them was that within Judaism, this was only allowed for a fixed number of time, for a fixed number of years. Anybody know what the maximum term was? Seven years, right? And then kicked in the sabbatical year. During the sabbatical year, drawing the principles out of the, the weekly Sabbath, the sabbatical year was a time when you set your captives free, when you cancelled all debts. And if somehow that hadn't happened, every 50th year was a jubilee year. So seven cycles of sabbaticals, and then that's 49 years. And then the 50th year, so in, in the cycle of the jubilee year, you would actually have two years back to back. Right? The sabbatical year and then the jubilee year. And in the jubilee year, you not only cancelled all debts if they hadn't been cancelled during the sabbatical or somebody had gotten into trouble during the sabbatical year, you not only cancelled the debts and set your slaves free, but you also returned land to the family from which you had taken it if they had to give up their land because they went so far into debt. And so there was this protection within Judaism of massive monopolies developing like we have in our world today. The balance of power was always restored. So this was not an uncommon practice, even for the Jews, when Jesus refers to this king taking the servant who cannot pay his debt and selling him into slavery. All right? They would have understood this language. Right. The servant, verse, 30, verse 26, the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Forgave him the debt. That's the first half of the story. Now that word compassion is an interesting word. You know what it is to feel sorry for something. Feeling sorry is not necessarily compassion. You can feel sorry for someone because of their circumstances and yet do nothing to alleviate the circumstances. Compassion is when you are so strongly moved to the core of your being that you are compelled to take action. So compassion is not just a, wow, I wish that that person weren't in that situation. Compassion is, that is a tragedy, that is a travesty, and I'm going to do everything I can, or at least something that I can, to alleviate the situation, to step in. And that's the picture of this king here. He doesn't just go, man, I really feel sorry for this guy, but I don't have an alternative here. I'm going to have to sell him into slavery. It's just going to be their lot for the rest of their lives. This man is moved. The king is moved to the core of his being. He's moved emotionally. He's moved spiritually. And he realizes there is something I can do. It's going to cost me. It's going to cost me a fortune to do this. But I'm actually going to acquit this man of his debt because it is impossible for him to pay it. Even if I do sell him into slavery for the rest of his life, him and his family, and take all his possessions so that he has nothing except his physical life, which he's going to spend the rest of it working for me, he's still not ever going to pay back that debt. So there's only one thing I can do for this man. But it's going to cost me dearly. I simply have to write off the debt. Now, let's understand this debt. 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. In the Roman era in which Christ is speaking, they traded with silver coins. One silver coin was called a denarius. In plural, denarii. One silver co coin is a denarius. Now, a talent is not a bunch of coins. A talent is a measurement of weight. Are you with me? So a denarius is a coin, but a talent is a measure of weight. In other words, if you take all the raw silver that we use to make the coins and you weigh the silver, you will come up with a measurement that would be in talents or part thereof. Are you with me? 10,000 talents is 213,840 kilograms of silver. You didn't get that. 
213,840 kilograms of silver. Anybody here got the money to pay for that? No. Can, do you get the scale of this man's debt? When you read it in terms of talents, you don't get it. Okay, 10,000 is a big number, but you might think it's 10,000 silver coins. No. No, 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 no. With 213,840 kilograms of silver, you could make a lot more than 10,000 silver coins. Are you with me? Do you get the idea that this man, uh, don't even ask me how he lost all that money. I, I have no idea. Maybe it was the slot machine thing. I don't know what it was. But 213,840 kilograms of silver, and he falls down in front of the king and says, I'll pay you back. Everyone in that room knew that he was begging for mercy because it is not even conceivable. Let me, let me try and break that down a little bit more for you. 213,840 kilograms of silver, 10,000 talents. You could employ 10,000 laborers for 18 years. I mean, does that help you get your mind around that? 10,000 laborers for 18 years. One talent could employ a laborer, one man, for 17 years. So let's say this guy goes to work for the king for the rest of his life. How many years would it take him to pay off 10,000 talents if it's going to take 17 years to pay back one talent? 10,000 times 17. 170 something, you know, thousand years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When he begs the man to give him time to pay him back, he knows he's never going to pay it. The king knows he's never going to pay it. And everybody in the room knows that that's absurd. You will never pay that back. Not in a thousand lifetimes. Not in a thousand lifetimes. Now look at the rest of the parable. Verse 28. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. There's that word, denarii, plural for denarius. So one denarius, one silver coin. About 3.89 grams of silver. So you can try and work out what 10,000 talents, 213,840 kilograms of silver is compared to a hundred coins weighing 3.89 grams. Okay? Now don't make a mistake here. What this man, what, what the fellow servant owed to his fellow servant was a significant amount of money. A hundred denarii, you would employ a laborer for a day of work, a common ordinary laborer in a vineyard or on a farm or something like that, and you'd pay him one denarius for a day of labor. So this is a significant amount of money. I mean, a hundred denarii is a hundred days worth of work. So if this fellow servant wanted to pay him back, he could sell himself, say, I will come and work for you for a hundred days. That's, that's, that's just under a third of a year without any breaks. Does that make sense? But do you get the idea that this amount could actually be paid back? He didn't have the money. This fellow servant didn't have the money right then and there. But it was actually conceivable that this servant could pay his fellow servant back. Even in a worst case scenario, if you went to work for him for free for a third of a year, he could pay the man back. It's a significant amount of money, but it's a reasonable amount of money. So the servant went out, found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant, deja vu, right? So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. This is a repeat of what happened a few minutes ago in the master's household, isn't it? Exactly the same thing. With one little difference. The cruelty with which the this, this servant actually approaches his fellow servant exceeds that of the master. It exceeds that of the king. The king did not grab the man by his throat. 
You can see this man being imposing, being threatening, being physically violent. He grabs him by the throat and says, pay me everything you owe me. The servant breaks free of that grip and falls down in humility before the man who's approached him with such violence and begs him for the same mercy that that man has just received a little while ago from the master, right? And then verse 30, the bad news, it says, but he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So he does to this man exactly what the king had threatened to do for him, but relented from doing. So, when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion? There's that word again, compassion. Should you not have been moved with the same heart that I was moved for with you? I felt compassion, a strong sense of feeling of pity that moved me to take proactive action to set you free. Should you not have been moved with that same spirit, compassion, on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry, moved from compassion and pity and mercy to justice, anger. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you, Peter, to you, scribe and Pharisee, to you, Fangarei, Seventh Day Adventist Church. So my heavenly father will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. It's not 490 times. It's not 70 times 7, literally. From the heart, with compassion, to set others free. I want you to contrast that debt. 100 denarii, 100 days worth of physical labor. That the servant refused to forgive his fellow servant when he had been forgiven 10,000 talents that couldn't even be paid back in a thousand lifetimes. Then I want you to go with me to the foot of the cross. And I want you to see the master of the household forgiving you your debt. As you stand before him and you beg because of the goodness in you to say, God, I will pay you back. I'll make up for my wrongdoing. I'll be, I'll be good from here on out. Just don't send me to the fires of hell. Have mercy upon me. I'll pay you back. And he looks down from the cross and he says to you, there's no ways in a thousand lifetimes that if you were perfectly good, you could make up for the 10,000 talents of squandering that you have done. There's only one thing I can do for you. I have to write your debt off, but in writing your debt off, it's going to cost me my life. Because the wages of sin is not 10,000 talents, it's not 213,840 kilograms of silver or of gold or of platinum or of precious stones or of anything this world regards as valuable. The wages of sin is death. Period. One sin, a thousand sins, a lifetime of sin, it doesn't matter. The wages of sin is death. The debt that you've incurred before God through a lifetime of sin is so huge that no amount of right doing can pay it back. Because as long as you and I talk on the level of behavior, of right doing, we also have to talk about our wrongdoing. That's why salvation is by grace through faith. That's why the only way to be saved is coming to the foot of the cross and receiving the grace of the master of the household who writes off your debt at tremendous cost to himself. Because if he was going to start to talk to you about your good behaviors to merit your eternal life, then you have to talk about your bad behaviors which don't merit eternal life but which merit eternal death. And that's why the Bible talks about death as something which you earn. But salvation is something which is gifted to you. Because if you want to earn it with your good works, it's too late. You've already earned death with your bad works. 
Something has to happen in the experience of salvation that takes us beyond the behavioral good and the behavioral bad. Why? Because again, if you're going to start to measure your bad, you have to be fair. In mathematics, they always taught me as a child, what you do to the one side of the equation, you do to the other side of the equation to keep it balanced. So if you want to measure your good works before your heavenly Father, then he also has to measure your bad works. And how many bad works does it take to tip the scale in the favor of death? One. One. One act of transgression. One act of sin. One departure from the character of God. And the weight, if you're talking scale language, the weight of that one transgression is heavier than all the good works you can put on the other side. And so the master of the household, as you're kneeling before him saying, please give me more time, I'll pay you back, I'll be good, I promise I won't do this anymore. He says, I don't want your promises. Uh, it, it means nothing to me. I know and you know that you will never pay this, back, this, this debt back over a thousand lifetimes. And so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I am going to write it off. But when I write off this debt, it's going to cost me some. It doesn't cost you. You're the one that incurred the debt. You're the one that, in a way, benefited from the debt, if you like. You're the one that squandered the fortune. But it's going to cost me to write it off. Because when I write it off, there's no one that can get it back. There's no one that can make it up, can return it to me. It's gone. But I'll write it off because I am moved by compassion for you. I feel for the human race, the Father says. I, I don't just sit in heaven going, man, that is a terrible life they're living down there. Man, that's horrible. If only they knew a better way. He's a God that is moved to action. That action is the cross. The world's debt cancelled as the life of one who is equal with God. God incarnate, Jesus, God in human flesh switches places, takes all badness, gives you all his goodness. And in that exchange of places, he must die because he owes that debt to the Father. But you have no reason to die because you no longer have sin to your credit. And the only thing that can cause death is sin. So when you receive that perfect life record of Christ, you now have no reason to die. God has no legitimate cause to put you to death. And so you move from death to eternal life. But Jesus, who has taken over your debt in your behalf, must die your death. Because all that is credited to his name is your life.